Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. We're going to back up and just do a little review here. Uh, we know that uh, last week um, we were journeying through salvation history, and we got up to the Abrahamic Covenant. And uh, I just want to do a little review. Um, we recall that uh, in the Abrahamic Covenant, there were uh, three great promises that were made to Abraham. God promised him that he would become a great nation and that God would give him a great name and that a great blessing would come through Abraham. All the nations would be blessed uh, through him. And so we saw those three and we talked about the sacrifice of Isaac or the attempted sacrifice of Isaac um, which was the great culminating event of Abraham's journey with God and um, in response to Abraham and Isaac's faithfulness we found that Isaac was a grown man at this time and he willingly cooperated with Abraham in that sacrifice, and as a result, uh, God gave to Abraham this promise that because you have not withheld your son, your only begotten son, I will surely bless you, and by your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So that's where we left off last week at that great offering of the only begotten son on the wood on top of the mountain out of love for the father and <laughs> God. And that's a very dramatic event. That's what I tell my students is the Calvary of the old Testament. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is the clearest image or type of Calvary that we have in the old Testament. And there in Genesis 22, uh, three times Isaac is referred to, um, by, um, by a very rare, uncommon Hebrew term, and that term is Yahid. And um, that, uh, that term is the one translated in um, uh, the New Testament as only begotten. So uh, you see here in my translation of uh, Genesis 22, I'm using the RSV CE2, the um, phrase here is only begotten. And of course, that term is taken up by the Apostle John in John 3.16 in the most famous verse of Scripture. So um, next time you see John 3.16 held up at a football game, uh, <laughs> think to yourself that uh, that's actually an allusion to Isaac and this sacrifice in Genesis 22. Uh, the Jews call this event the Akedah, and in Jewish theology, it is um, almost as important as the sacrifice of Christ is in Christian theology. And uh, part of the significance of it is the fact that the temple was later built on the site of this altar uh, where Isaac was um, offered up to God. And in later Jewish theology, came to the opinion that the sacrifices that were offered in the Jerusalem temple were actually commemorations of the one meritorious sacrifice of their ancestor Isaac on that very site. Um, they reasoned that the blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away sin and really didn't have merit before God, but the willingness to sacrifice himself of their ancestor Isaac did have merit in God's eyes. And so the animal sacrifices on the site of the temple, on the site where Isaac once had offered himself were in fact commemorations of that great event. So you ponder that, you, you see that there's great similarities there with our own Eucharistic theology, the idea of a commemoration of a great meritorious sacrifice by an only begotten son. 
So that was a little bit on the Abrahamic covenant. And uh, so our paper should look like this by now. We've got these three sacrifices uh, sketched in. Uh, we've been um, sketching it also in the corner the food associated with each of the sacrifices since we're building up to the house of bread and the idea of Christ as the bread of life. And uh, the tree of life was associated with the Adamic covenant. We shifted to the Noahic covenant and um, uh, the, the animal sacrifice of Noah after he got off the ark was the meal associated with that covenant. We saw how we went from a bloodless sacrifice to a bloody sacrifice because of the introduction of human sin. And when we move to the Abrahamic uh, covenant and we have um, the self-sacrifice of Isaac on the altar, we see that uh, we've now moved to an even more serious um, escalation in uh, the kind of sacrifice, a clearer um, type or image of Christ who will offer himself on the wood as food for the world. So at this point, we're going to move now into the next great uh, covenant, which is the Mosaic. And uh, we can say, well, what happened between Abraham and Moses? Well, uh, we don't have a major fall between Abraham and Moses. Instead, we have God setting about his plan to fulfill his three great promises to Abraham. And of course, that first great promise was that Abraham was going to become a great nation. And so God had to arrange for the descendants of Abraham to become a great nation. And the way that, that, that God did that was to allow them to go down to Egypt, which was a country of relative peace uh, and prosperity. And uh, there in Egypt, uh, they multiplied uh, greatly, exceedingly, um, and they had a steady food supply. And over the course of uh, several generations, they became very, very numerous, became a great nation in Egypt. Uh, when they became a great nation, they were enslaved by the Pharaoh. Now, they, they had the numbers to be a great nation, but what they needed now at this point was some land of their own. So at that point in the story, uh, God sends to them a deliverer, Moses, who leads them out of Egypt and leads them out to Mount Sinai, and there gives them a kind of constitution which will help to form them into a great nation. So in our fourth box, we're going to sketch in uh, an image here of Mount Sinai. And on top of that, we're going to put Moses. And in order to tell Moses apart from his ancestors, uh, we're going to uh, draw two beams of light shining from Moses's face. Um, we recall that because Moses spent time with God at Mount Sinai, when he came down, his face shone with beams of light, the scriptures say. Um, St. Jerome uh, mistranslated that as horns coming from the face of Moses. And that's why if you look at older Catholic iconography, old stained glass windows or sculptures of Moses, you'll often see little horns coming from his forehead. That's because of St. Jerome, uh, Jerome's uh, mistranslation of those beams as cornu or horns. Uh, St. Jerome was a great translator. He rarely made mistakes, but that was one little um, a glitch that he had, but it's really beams of light. So we make those coming from Moses's face and we'll make uh, the two tablets of the Ten Commandments there in his um, uh, left hand. And uh, we'll uh, represent the great uh, theophany, the great appearance of God at Sinai in storm imagery um, by a cloud and a lightning bolt. That's the great uh, divine storm that manifested the presence of God on Mount Sinai. And um, that's all recorded in Exodus 19 through 24. So the idea behind the Mosaic Covenant that was that God was leading the people out of Egypt. Uh, they were on the way to Israel. It was only supposed to be um, a three-hour tour, a three-hour tour to get up to the land of Israel. You know what happened. Uh, they got to... Uh, sidetracked on the way for 40 years, but um, it was supposed to be just a short uh, trip up to the land of Israel, and on the way they stop off at Mount Sinai to get this fundamental um, constitution, uh, these laws that will form them into 
a nation. Now, something very significant is said in Exodus 19, 5 and 6, um, some of the most important verses in the Old Testament. In Exodus 19, 5 and 6, God promises the people of Israel when they gather at the foot of Mount Sinai that if they keep the covenant which they are about to receive, they shall become for God a royal priesthood. Now, some translations say kingdom of priests. Others say royal priesthood. That's because the Hebrew can be taken either way. Let's go with royal priesthood, which is the way that St. Peter translates it in 1 Peter 2.9. What God was saying to the people is, again, if they kept the covenant, they would be a royal priesthood. And that means that all of the promises to Abraham could have been fulfilled with the Mosaic covenant if they had kept the terms of the Ten Commandments and the other laws that God gave them at Sinai. You see, um, if they had kept it, they would have been, as, it, as God promised, a royal priesthood. Royal means kingly. They would have been a race of kings, which would have meant they would have spread out over the world and they would have ruled the other nations. And that would have fulfilled the promise of great name or kingship that had been given to Abraham. Um, obviously, as a, as a nation of royal priests, they would have been a great nation, and that would have fulfilled that first promise that God gave to Abraham. And priests uh, have the responsibility to bless other people. Sacrifice and blessing are the two great responsibilities of the biblical priesthood. So as a race of priests, they would have blessed the other nations, and that would have fulfilled the promise of a great blessing to all the nations. So the Mosaic Covenant could have fulfilled the whole enchilada, if you uh, will follow me, um, the whole promises given to, to Abraham. But unfortunately, uh, the people of Israel did not keep the terms of the covenant. In fact, they broke the Ten Commandments. So we're putting a little crack there in the tablets. Now, what I'm about to do, you don't have to draw in your uh, fourth box there. I'm going to animate a whole bunch of things. I'm going to give um, the, uh, the rest of the story, uh, so to speak, here and just animate what happened afterwards, and it's too much to draw in the box. But let's just go through what happens. They broke the Ten Commandments about 40 days after receiving them by worshiping a golden calf, which, of course, violated the first and greatest of the commandments, which is to have no other gods before uh, the God of Israel. Um, by the way, that golden calf, Egyptian bull god. So they were basically going back to good old foot stomp and snake handling, Egyptian religion, which is what they had grown up with. And since they thought Moses wasn't coming down from the mountain, they just wanted to go back to what they were used to. Well, they broke the Ten Commandments, and um, that was in Exodus 32. Now, in the aftermath, we remember that Moses pleaded for the people, and uh, that was in Exodus 34. And uh, so God gave new tablets um, to the people and renewed the covenant because of Moses' intercession. And that takes place in Exodus 34. So we get two, two new tablets. We renew the covenant. Um, that's all well and good. But there is a catch. Okay. Look at this. We're bringing in some more tablets here. Okay. Read the fine print. When we renew the covenant, God adds in a lot more law. The entire book of Leviticus, represented by these extra tablets that we've uh, tossed in there at Mount Sinai. Okay. So there's a catch. When you, break, when you break a covenant, there is consequences. And one of the consequences that Israel received from breaking the uh, covenant uh, by the golden calf was that they received a lot more regulation that they had to follow. The entire book of Leviticus was added in with all those sacrifices and other purity rituals. Those laws of Leviticus have an essentially penitential purpose. It's like going to confession, confessing your sins, and receiving uh, things to do in order to make reparation for your sins, and we call that a penance. So these additional laws had a penitential or reparational function to help to train the people of Israel back to godliness after their sin. Um, unfortunately, it didn't quite work out that way. So anyway, after having received these additional laws of Leviticus, they packed up from Sinai. So I'm packing up Sinai here. We're packing up Sinai. 
And they began to walk through the desert. So the desert's very flat. There's the desert. So they're walking through the desert. And they forgot about the Ten Commandments while they were walking through the desert. In fact, they were not very cooperative with uh, Moses at all for 40 years. So at the end of all that wandering through the desert, Moses was not a happy camper anymore. And in fact, he basically read them the riot act at the end of 40 years, and that we call the riot act Deuteronomy. Uh, quite seriously, Deuteronomy was a kind of martial law that, uh, that Moses laid down on the people after putting up with 10 rebellions that they perpetrated during 40 years of wandering in the wilderness during the book of Numbers. And um, Moses implemented a kind of zero tolerance policy at the end of those years and added a bunch of additional laws into the covenant. Uh, that scroll that you see there is all these additional laws that are in the book of Deuteronomy. Most of those harsh laws that we remember from the Old Testament, things like, um, you know, people getting stoned for doing this or for doing that, those laws are mostly in the book of Deuteronomy. And again, they're part of law that Moses laid down to kind of restrain the people after their sinful tendencies during all those years of wandering. So a lot of the laws of Deuteronomy um, were not God's highest and best, just like the kind of laws that you implement uh, after a hurricane uh, in order to get control of, you know, say, greater New Orleans after things have gone pretty wild. You know, you may have a 9 p.m. curfew and have rather strict consequences if anyone's out after that, um, and uh, have strong anti-looting laws and things like that. But th those kind of uh, martial law provisions that you put in place after a natural disaster, those aren't meant to last forever. Well, neither were the laws of Deuteronomy. They, they were not meant to last forever. Um, unfortunately, though, uh, in the centuries that followed, some of the Jews became very um, fixated on these laws, which were, in fact, imperfect. Um, our Lord corrects some of the laws of Deuteronomy when we get to um, the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, there's six times in the Sermon on the Mount where our Lord says things like, you have heard that it was said, or you have heard that it was written, but I say to you. And uh, for example, our Lord says, uh, you've heard that it was said, if you will divorce your wife, write her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that if anyone divorces his wife, he commits adultery. Uh, etc. And so um, it's interesting that the law of divorce is only found in the book of Deuteronomy. It was one of the concessions that Moses introduced because of the hardness of the heart of the Israelites that he had witnessed for 40 years in the wilderness. There's many other concessions and, uh, as it were, moral compromises, as well as strenuous punishments that Moses introduced in Deuteronomy. Um, even the prophets of Israel recognize this in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 25, the prophet Ezekiel refers to the laws of Deuteronomy as, um, quite literally from the Hebrew, a bunch of no good laws. Okay, um, So here you have even an Israelite prophet recognizing that the laws of Deuteronomy were not the highest and best um, of, uh, of God's intention. And uh, so our Lord comes, and uh, in the New Covenant, uh, many of these laws are corrected. So that's a little background there on the Mosaic Covenant. Let's sum up by saying what happened after Moses. Well, there was a fall, the golden calf in Exodus 32. The covenant was renewed in Exodus 34, but more laws were added in, Leviticus. Then we travel through the wilderness for 40 years in the book of Numbers. We have a lot more falls, uh, ten, 10 rebellions against God, if you count them up, which I have counted them up because I had to write a textbook on the Pentateuch. And had to go through there, and there are uh, 10 major rebellions in the book of Numbers. Uh, works out to a nice literary pattern. And then after the book of Numbers, uh, we have the covenant renewed in Deuteronomy, but uh, the laws there are severe and sometimes morally compromised. Okay, now before we leave the Mosaic Covenant, let's just talk about some meals associated with the covenant of Moses. All these meals... Um, happened, took place prior to the sin of the people. And of course, the Passover is one great meal that's associated with the covenant of Moses. And, um, oops, let me back that up. Uh, we know that our Lord um, obviously transformed the Passover into the Eucharist 
in Luke 22 and the parallel passages of Matthew, Matthew 26 and uh, Mark 14. Um, so obviously the Passover is a great covenant meal um, associated with the old covenant of Moses, but also the manna, the bread that came from heaven um, during uh, their wanderings in the wilderness. Exodus 16 mentions it. It's also mentioned in the book of Numbers. They received this bread of heaven that had this sweet taste like wafers made from honey during their 40 years of wandering. That's a great Eucharistic type. The Eucharist is our new bread, which comes down from heaven. We recall that in John 6, um, our Lord uh, preaches on Exodus 16 and identifies himself as the true bread, which comes down from heaven. But then there's a less uh, well-known meal that is closely associated with the covenant of Moses. Um, and that's the meal that Moses and the elders of the people shared with God after the covenant between God and Israel was uh, solemnized in Exodus 24, verses 1 through 8. That was the sprinkling of the blood of the covenant on the people and upon the altar by Moses. And when that sprinkling of the blood ritual was concluded and the covenant was established, then Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and a representative 70 elders of Israel, they all went up onto Sinai, and they saw God up there. I've, I've abbreviated this verse here. And um, the Bible actually says, they beheld God and ate and drank. So with this, this meal with God's presence at the top of Mount Sinai. That, too, is a very important Eucharistic type because, of course, the Eucharist is our meal in the presence of God. It's interesting that the Hebrew of Exodus 24, um, actually, I think this is verse 11 here, uh, but uh, in any event, the, the Hebrew here says, um, it, it can, I should say, it can be translated, they beheld God, and in this way they ate and drank. And in some streams of Jewish tradition, that was understood to mean that their very vision of God was the way that they were nourished. That is to say, this, the, the sight of God provided them food and drink. And um, wow, what a beautiful uh, image that is. What a beautiful tradition in Jewish thought that is. And then we can see in this passage of Exodus 24, a real anticipation of the beatific vision where the vision of God will be our food and drink for all eternity. But uh, even now in this life, we anticipate the beatific vision um, in things like Eucharistic adoration, when we behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and uh, the sight of our Eucharistic Lord becomes our spiritual food. So those are some meals associated with the Mosaic Covenant. Uh, let's move on now. And this is what our paper should look like. Um, we should have four covenants across the top of our paper. And then in the little box uh, associated with Mosaic Covenant, we're going to make these little pieces of manna here falling down from heaven, dropping down there. And uh, we're going to use the the manna, the bread from heaven, as our central meal uh, associated with the Mosaic Covenant as we move forward toward the house of bread, towards Christ the bread of life come down and uh, uh, laid in a food trough uh, for the life of the world at the Incarnation. And now we're going to move on to the next covenant after the Mosaic, and that is the Davidic Covenant. Now, you might say, well, what happened between Moses and David? That's a span of, oh, somewhere between um, 250 to 500 years, depending on which chronological scheme uh, you employ. So a uh, couple hundred to 500 years, somewhere in that ballpark. What happened between Moses and David? Well, we said, you know, those laws of Deuteronomy were kind of like a martial law that Moses laid on the people of Israel at the end of his life. And they... They hobbled along under the Mosaic Covenant, under these uh, strenuous laws, and they didn't do very well. They, they had a lot of ups and downs, but mostly downs, and that's recorded in the book of Judges, um, which is uh, 
kind of an, an account of uh, the really rocky period that Israel experienced after after jo- uh, Moses' successor Joshua had led them into the promised land and got them uh, settled in there. Things did not go really well. And things continued to go poorly, even under the first king, who was Saul, um, because Saul, this first king, uh, didn't stay obedient to God for very long during his kingship. Things really didn't start looking up until 1 Samuel 16, and that's where David strides onto the stage of biblical history. And there in 1 Samuel 16, we read about the prophet Samuel, who went to the house of Jesse, David's father, and looked for a king among Jesse's sons. Uh, Jesse had eight sons. Samuel went through the older seven of them. Each one, something was wrong with him. Finally, we get down to the last son. Last son wasn't even important enough to be in the house. They had to send out and call him in from watching the sheep. They bring in the little kid. That's the one. Samuel goes and anoints this little boy, this boy David. And it says in 1 Samuel that when Samuel anointed David, the spirit came upon David from that day forward. And that's a very, very significant statement there in 1 Samuel 16. David was granted the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit remained on David in a stable basis. And you see, that's very unique in the Old Testament. It's not that the Holy Spirit wasn't active in the Old Testament. It's rather that in the Old Testament, the Spirit came upon certain people for certain periods of time, but the Spirit wasn't given out to all the people on a durative or a a lasting basis. That's One of the unique things about the New Covenant is that we're given the Spirit on a lasting basis. Now, David is this very unique figure in the Old Testament who almost, as it were, experiences the New Covenant in advance. And so he's given this gift of the Holy Spirit in 1 Samuel 16, and he responds to that gift of the Spirit. We know from St. Paul that the Spirit is the Spirit of the Son, And it's the spirit that enables us to cry out, Abba, Father. And David corresponded to this this, uh, filial uh, spirit that had been given to him, and he behaved as a son of God. And so God, um, seeing this correspondence of David to the gift of the divine spirit that he had been given, God arranged for David to rise and become king over all of Israel. And um, as I tell my students, it's kind of like God is looking down on Israel and he sees David um, living out the Holy Spirit down there. And God says, hot dog, I've got a live one down there. I'm going to take him. I'm going to take him. I'm going to lift him up and I'm going to set him over here. and I'm going to place him on top of all the people. Okay, so he takes Mount Zion here, which is, uh, which is going to become the capital of Israel. And he puts David there on top of Mount Zion. And this is going to go in our fifth box. And uh, we're going to sketch in David there. And so God puts him uh, above all the people. And uh, the idea behind this is, since, since most of the people of Israel are not living as my children, and they're not living up to the Mosaic Covenant. But I've got this one Israelite who is living as my son, living in a good relationship with me. I'm going to make him king over all the people. And then if the people will at least obey their king, they will get trickle-down blessings. I see out there uh, that uh, there's many of you that are probably old enough to remember uh, President Reagan. Do you remember Reaganomics? Remember how Reaganomics was supposed to work? It's supposed to be trickled down prosperity, right? So think think about the Davidic covenant as uh, as spiritual Reaganomics or David Adamics, uh, as it were. We've got trickle down blessings for all the people as long as they be the uh, they obey uh, their king. So we're going to sketch in David here. And uh, there he is on Mount Zion with a scepter in his right hand, ruling over all the people. And uh, he's actually given the privilege of the covenant. 
In 2 Samuel 7, which is a passage that we're going to look at in just a moment here. But uh, we're going to sketch in another thing in our fifth box. Next to David, we're going to sketch in the temple. Now, the temple was a big boxy uh, structure and uh, had a large central door in it, which we can sketch there. Just one door that faced east. And uh, we're going to put a little star of David there to mark it as the temple, even though that's a little bit anachronistic. But in any event, there's the temple, because the temple, likewise, is a very important part of the covenant uh, with uh, David. Um, the building of the temple was part of the terms of the covenant, as we're going to see. So let's um, move now. Uh, to looking at a very important passage of Scripture. I hope this uh, is showing up well enough for you to read on the screen there, 2 Samuel 7. Okay, Danny's giving me the thumbs up there, so that's uh, apparently visible to you all. Um, but the reason we want to look at this passage is because 2 Samuel 7 is one of the great pivotal passages of Scripture. Um, you know, not every passage of Scripture is as important as every other one. You know, um, you know uh, Judith 7 uh, is just not as important as uh, Psalm 2. Um, I hate to break it to you fans of Judith, but uh, it's just not. Um, Psalm 2 is much more central to, uh, to salvation history, shall we say. So all Scripture is good. I mean, I love all Scripture, and it's all inspired. But certain passages are kind of like fulcrums that um, that leverage the path of salvation history, as it were. And 2 Samuel 7 is one of those fulcrum or pivot passages that really, um, you know, changes the course of salvation history. And it's also a passage that's a very important to Christmas time. Um, it's very important, in fact, uh, to, um, to the Annunciation. Um, and uh, that was our gospel for today. It's the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And uh, it's interesting that in Gabriel's um, announcement to the Blessed Mother about the birth of Christ, uh, if we look what the angel Gabriel actually says to the Blessed Mother, we can see that uh, Gabriel is basically um, paraphrasing or, or um, synthesizing much of what was said back in 2 Samuel 7 to uh, David. And so let's look at this passage here. I've got um, parts of 2 Samuel 7, 8 through 16. This is an oracle from the prophet Nathan uh, that he brings to David. And this is after David has prayed to God and, um, and talked to God about the possibility of building a temple. Uh, for God's presence. And so uh, God is honored by David's desire, um, but, uh, but God is actually going to wait until uh, David's son Solomon for the temple to be built. But in any event, God sends the prophet Nathan to David with this message. And it goes like this, you shall say to my servant David, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Now, that's significant right there. The Lord will make you a house. Remember that David wanted to build a house for God. And God, as it were, says to David, what? You build me a house? No, I build you a house. Okay. But there's a little play on the word house here because house of God means a temple. But house of David means a dynasty. Just like we say about the ruling dynasty of Britain. It's the house of Windsor that rules that country, uh, my, the land of my origin, uh, the Netherlands is ruled by the House of Orange. Um, that's the royal line there. So we call, you know, a dynasty the house of whatever. So the house of David was to become the royal dynasty. And when David wanted to build God a house, God returned the favor and said, no, I will build you a house. That is to say, I'm gonna build you a dynasty. And so God said, when your days are fulfilled, I will raise up your seed after you. Now, this is usually translated as offspring um, in English uh, Bibles, but it's literally the word seed in Hebrew. And that's very significant. Let me just digress for a moment, because Danny has told me that uh, you're all great theologians and Bible scholars anyway, and so I should go deeper uh, with you and... Uh, uh, stuff of this nature. So let's go into the 700 level uh, biblical theology here. 
and uh, talk about the idea of the seed in the Old Testament. And there are three great seeds in the Old Testament. Um, there is, first of all, the seed of the woman, announced in Genesis 3.15. And then there is the seed of Abraham, mentioned in Genesis 22.18. Okay, the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. That will destroy Satan, right? Genesis 3.15. The seed of Abraham will bring blessing to all the nations of the earth. That was the blessing given to Abraham and Isaac after the Akedah, the binding of Isaac in uh, Genesis 22. And then the third great seed of the Old Testament is the seed of David, who is the king that will rule over all the earth. So one seed will crush Satan's head. One seed will bring uh, blessing to all the nations. And one seed will be the king that rules over all the earth. Now, in the mystery of God's providence, all three seeds are one. And we see this actually in, um, in the first verse of the New Testament, Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, we're going to we're gonna look at that verse next week when we wrap this all up. And we're going to see how Matthew, in a very subtle way, um, uh, indicates that uh, all the seeds, the three great seeds of the Old Testament, have found their fulfillment in the one seed of Mary um, in uh, the first chapter of Matthew. But anyway, let's go back to this. And uh, God says, when your days are fulfilled to David, he says, I will raise up your seed after you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. Okay. So, um, again, if you compare Luke 1, the message of Gabriel, to um, this passage of 2 Samuel, you can see that uh, what Gabriel says um, is basically a synopsis of the covenant promises given to David. So even here on this uh, Feast of the Immaculate Conception, in the process of moving through Advent towards Christmas, we are still being reminded of how Christ uh, fulfills um, the covenant promises given to David. Um, Luke 1, 32 and 33 says of the son of Mary that he will be great and he will be called the son of the Most High and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And you can see every element of those verses is from this passage. And um, if we had the broader passage here, I've only got an abbreviation here, but uh, if we had the other surrounding verses, we would uh, we'd see even more connections there. So, um, Let's look at this. This promise to, to David is that he's going to have a son after him who will build a house for my name. We know that Solomon did that. So there was a, kind of an immediate horizon of fulfillment with David's immediate successor, Solomon. And uh, Solomon's throne was established. And then we have the statement, I will be his father and he shall be my son. Scholars call this the covenant formula. And that's because when you made a covenant in ancient Israel, at the heart of the ritual, the main covenant party, uh, for example, in a marriage, it would be the husband, um, would step forward and pronounce the basic structure of the covenant. And in terms of a marriage covenant, it was like this, I will be your husband and you shall be my wife, okay? So in the ancient Israelite marriage ceremony, at, at the climactic point, the husband would pronounce those words, I will be your husband, and you shall be my wife. That stated succinctly the heart of the covenant relationship. Now, if it was a covenant of adoption, then the father would step forward, and for this orphan that he was adopting, he would say, I will be your father, and you shall be my son, you know, state the covenant relationship. When God makes his covenant with Israel, God says, I will be your God, and you will be my people. Okay, so this is the covenant formula. And so we see that here, um, the covenant formula for the covenant of David, I will be his father, and he shall be my son. This is the continuing promise 
to David and to all of David's descendants. They will be sons of God by covenant. Now, we know, of course, that our Lord fulfills this in an even more radical way. Um, Jesus is the great temple builder. The temple that he builds is his body, as he says in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 2, uh, verses uh, 19 through 21. When he cleanses the temple, and they ask him, what sign shall you perform that you have the authority to do these things? Jesus says, tear down this temple, and in three days I will build it again. They say, it's taken us 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to build it in three days. And then the apostle explains, but he was talking to them about the temple of his body. Okay, So Jesus is the great temple builder who rebuilds the temple of his body through the resurrection. Three days, he builds that temple body back. But then since he gives his temple body to be eaten by all his disciples, his body gets extended to the mystical body. And so in Ephesians chapter 2 and in Revelation 21 and 22, we see the church as um, the body of Christ and the new temple that Christ has built. The mystical body of Christ is the temple. And of course, Christ is the son of the father, not simply by covenant, but in a profound way because he was eternally begotten uh, by the father. Now, there's something interesting here. Remember that David wanted to build a house for God. That is to say, David wanted to build the temple, but he didn't get that privilege that went to his son Solomon. God comes back to David and says, you're not going to build me a house. I'm going to build you a house. Uh, I'm gonna, that is to say, I'm going to build you a dynasty. So we have these two houses that are kind of reciprocally related. We have the house of God which will be built by the David, have the house of David, which will be built by God. So it's kind of David's house scratches God's house is back, you know, back and forth. You know, the, the house of David has the responsibility to maintain the house of God, the temple, and God has the responsibility to maintain the house of David, David's dynasty. Now, in the mystery of God's providence, when we get to the New Testament, we see that these two houses become one, Okay the house of David and the house of God become one person, the temple and the king, the royal son become merged into the mystical body of the Messiah. So it's a very uh, beautiful thing. And um, that really becomes the house of bread, right? Because the house of bread for all the world is the mystical body of Christ, which is the temple of God the house of God, um, and that house of God is the source of nourishment for all people. Um, let's look at another important passage that's associated with the covenant of David, and that's Psalm 2. Uh, psalm 2 is one of the most important psalms for um, the New Testament. Um, it's one of the most quoted, um, perhaps, I think Psalm 110, technically speaking, is the most quoted in the New Testament. Um, but uh, Psalm 2 uh, would, would make a close uh, second. Um, but in any event, uh, Psalm 2 is very important. Psalm 2 is a covenant psalm about the covenant that God gave to David. Um, in verse 6, uh, God says, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. We see that in the picture that we drew. There's God's king there on Zion, the holy hill of God. And then um, the psalmist says, I will tell the decree of the Lord. He said to me, oh, by the way, this word decree in Hebrew is often a synonym for covenant. So it's almost like saying, I will tell the covenant of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Okay, that's the covenant formula there. That's another way of saying, I will be your father and you will be my son. You're my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth, your possession, you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So this is the, the promise of um, universal kingship to uh, the son of David. This image of ruling with a rod of iron that comes up again in another passage of scripture that's closely associated with uh, this Feast of the Immaculate Conception, and that's uh, Revelation 12. Um, the image of the heavenly queen uh, in heaven crowned with uh, 12 stars, 
with the uh, moon under her feet, clothed with the sun. This is the image that will also likewise be very important in a few days on December 12th on the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, since our Blessed Mother showed herself to Juan Diego in an image um, that, uh, that is drawn from uh, Revelation 12. And it says in Revelation 12 that this uh, heavenly queen, which we know in one sense to be a representation of our Blessed Mother, in another sense it's really an image of the church, but of course our Blessed Mother is the icon of the church, as the Catechism says. But in any event, um, the, this heavenly queen gives birth to a male child in Revelation 12.5 who is destined to rule the nations with a rod of iron. That, of course, is a reference to Christ, um, but interestingly, Christ is identified there in Revelation 12, 5, as the seed of the woman, but also as the heir of the promises of the Davidic covenant, who gets this rod of iron to rule the nations. So always that Davidic connection. Uh, Jesus really is the, uh, the son of David come to rule over all the earth. So. Um, that is the Davidic Covenant. Um, let's sum up the terms of the Davidic Covenant in these three points. The main terms are that the king is going to be the son of God, and the king will build the temple, the house of God, and the king will rule the whole world. So this is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham that a great name, which means uh, royalty, um, I think I emphasized that last week, that Great name is an ancient idiom or an ancient uh, phrase that uh, is associated with kingship um, in, uh, in uh, antiquity. Uh, so uh, that promise of royalty or great name is now fulfilled through Abraham's seed, that is to say through David here. So that is the Davidic covenant. So what happened to the Davidic covenant? Well... If things went well during the lifetime of David and his rule. Uh, but uh, after David's uh, immediate successor, Solomon, things began to decline because after Solomon, most of David's descendants were rascals who did not want to live as sons of God, and did not want to follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And so we enter into a period of decline that extends from 1 Kings 12 all the way to the end of 2 Kings. And this period of decline culminates in exile. The people are driven out of their land, out to Babylon, just like Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden uh, when they violated the covenant. Of course, God was a lot more patient with uh, Israel than he was with Adam and Eve, but uh, they both end up losing their territory, their land, their garden home because of covenant violation. Well, you might say, what's God doing during this whole time? You know, is God just sitting up there on his hands in heaven, looking down and watching everything uh, go down the tube? Well, not at all. God was very active during this whole time, trying to urge the people to return to him. He was active in sending the prophets. And that's our segue into uh, next week's uh, talks. We're going to pick up next week talking about the promise of a new covenant that came in the great prophets of Israel. And then we'll talk about the fulfillment of the new covenant in the New Testament. Um, so that's as far as we're going to go for this evening, but I do have a few things because we have a few moments left, a few little extras to do with you. First of all, I'll show you what our, what our paper should look like at this point, something like this. Um, we've got the four covenants through Moses up at the top, um, with the, uh, the manna as the food associated with Moses. We've sketched in the Davidic covenant here in our fifth square. Up in the little corner, for the meal associated with the Davidic Covenant, we have an image of a simple stick figure king who's holding a cup in one hand and a piece of bread in the other. And this is a reference to 1 Kings chapter 6. Just before David received the covenant from God in 2 Samuel chapter 7, David did a very wonderful thing. He took the Ark of the Covenant up into Jerusalem and he placed it there in a sanctuary in order to put 
worship at the heart of the new kingdom which he was establishing. And in fact, David gathered all Israel to Jerusalem to celebrate this event with the ark being brought up and uh, placed in a central um, a tent that he pitched for it where the people could come and worship. And all the people rejoiced and David led the procession dressed as a priest because he had become a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, according to Psalm 110. Maybe next week we'll get into talking about David's uh, priestly status for right now. Just trust me, David was both a priest and a king. But David uh, acted as a priest and led the liturgical procession of the Ark of the Covenant up into Jerusalem. And when he had gathered all the people up into Jerusalem for this great celebration, he offered sacrifice and then he fed all the people. And um, the Hebrew in 2 Samuel 6 is a little bit confused, but um, several scholars argue that uh, what the Hebrew says is that, um, in the, this would be in 2 Samuel 6, 19, that um, David fed the whole people with a cake of bread, a cup of wine, and a portion of raisins in um, uh, again, that was in Second Samuel six nineteen. So he fed all the people with a um, a cake of bread and a cup of wine. Some translations read a portion of meat instead of cup of wine because the Hebrew is a little bit debated there. But uh, uh, regardless, especially if we take the Hebrew as talking about a portion of bread and a portion of wine, we can see this um, as a very strong Eucharistic type. We have this meal that the Davidic king sponsors for the whole people of God at the king's expense, consisting of bread and wine. And uh, every time we come to the Eucharistic, Eucharistic table, we're fulfilling that because what is the Eucharist other than a feast for the whole people of God provided by the son of David at his own expense, consisting of bread and wine. So that, uh, that meal that David offers to all Israel there in 2 Samuel 6, that's the meal that we're going to associate with the Davidic covenant as we move forward uh, towards the house of bread, towards uh, Christ, the great uh, covenantal bread that comes down from heaven at the Feast of the Incarnation. And uh, I've got some other little goodies for you because uh, we have another five minutes or so here. And uh, I just want to look at, look at some uh, very Advent-ish uh, texts from the New Testament with you and show how they reflect some of the things that we've talked about tonight um, from, um, from the Davidic Covenant. And one of those texts is the Benedictus. Uh, last week, we looked at the Magnificat. Uh, one of these great songs, these great canticles from the infancy narratives of Luke's gospel, Luke 1 and 2. Now we look at the uh, Benedictus. Um, both the Magnificat and the Benedictus, of course, are used in very prominent places in the Liturgy of the Hours for morning prayer and for evening prayer. So let's look here at... Uh, at what Zechariah, that great saint, uh, says. This is the RSV CE 2 that I'm reading from. And uh, Zechariah says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up for us a horn of salvation in the house of his servant David. Okay, now there's a, uh, an Old Testament prophecy that talks about a horn being raised up for David. Um, but uh, what this is saying is uh, a, a fulfillment of God's promises of old to David. So, so um, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, sees in the birth of John and the birth of Jesus these covenant promises to David uh, really being fulfilled. The house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, because most of the prophets uh, predicted that the promises to David would be restored one day. That's what we're going to see next week. And then uh, Zechariah continues that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. And then he says, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers 
and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. These three lines are basically all the same. This phrase, to perform the mercy, have you ever thought about that? In English, we don't talk about performing the mercy very much. That's kind of like, that sounds odd to our ears. That's not really an English idiom. It's not a Greek idiom either. What it, it, it's actually a Hebrew idiom. When you are in a covenant relationship with somebody uh, in, in ancient Israel, you had a duty to perform mercy toward them. In Hebrew, it was to asa chesed. Okay, the, the Hebrew word for mercy is chesed, H-E-S-E-D. Very important word. It's often translated mercy, but its deeper meaning is covenant fidelity. Okay, so here to perform the mercy, that means to, to keep covenant, Promise to our fathers. Where did God promise mercy to the fathers? Well, Genesis 22, 15 through 18, those promises that he made to Abraham are really the primary place. Um, and we see here, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, that means basically the same thing as to remember his holy covenant. Um, again, to remember in Hebrew is, is a term associated with the covenant. We remember for example, when um, the scriptures talk about Noah, how Noah was floating out there uh, on the waters for 150 days, and then the scripture says God remembered Noah. And that doesn't mean that God was up in heaven saying, oh, there's that guy floating around out there. I forgot about him. Better get him out of there before he runs out of food. You know, It's not like that at all. It, uh, in Hebrew, the idea of remembering is a covenant concept, and it means to, to act in such a way as to keep your covenant promises. And, and we see that here, to remember his holy covenant. So in John the Baptist and Jesus, God is remembering the covenant, that is to say, acting to fulfill the covenant promises. And then the, which, ho which holy covenant, Zechariah? The one with Adam? The one with Noah? The one with Moses? Which one? This one. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham. See how covenant and oath are being treated as synonymous here in Luke 1, 72 and 73. And that makes perfect sense because last week we learned that a covenant is the extension of kinship by an oath. It's when you swear somebody into your family, right? So to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. This verse 73 is a direct reference to uh, Genesis 22, verses 15 and 18, um, because that's the only place where God swears an oath to Abraham in the Pentateuch. Uh, and it's not just to Abraham, but it's also to Isaac. And, and then Zechariah goes on and says to grant us that we might serve him without fear, and, and the Benedictus plays out. So Benedictus, which, um, you know, those who pray the, uh, the office um, recite the Benedictus every day, part of the infancy narratives of Luke. It's very, very much part of the season of the year. But the Benedictus is founded on Covenant with David concepts and covenant with Abraham concepts. Let's move on to one more example from the New Testament. And uh, this, is, this is the Annunciation once more. And um, we already went over this a bit. I read it for you. That's because I forgot that I had it on a slide. I was going to show it to you later. So, But here it is with some nice artwork in the background. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. It's a little bit of a weak translation there. Um, the, uh, uh, the Greek is a little bit stronger than that. Um, and then it goes on to say, behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, which means salvation. It is the same name as the name Joshua, by the way. Um, and just a little digression on that. Um, the uh, we, we see in the Old Testament that Joshua is Moses' successor, right? Um, so uh, as, uh, as one Catholic school child famously wrote on a test, uh, Moses never did lead the people to Canada. That's absolutely correct. 
you think about it, it's true. <laughs> Moses did not get the people of Israel to Canada. <laughs> not sure that that's exactly what the student intended to mean, but uh, it was true. Uh, well, yeah, we know, we know that really the case, Moses didn't get the people across the river into the promised land. He died before that happened. And see, Moses is symbolic of the Moses, uh, the Mosaic Covenant. You see, the, uh, the Mosaic Covenant will not get you over the river into the promised land. Okay? You, need, you need a better covenant, and you need a better covenant mediator than Moses. And so Moses is succeeded by Yeshua in Hebrew. We say Joshua, but it's a man whose name means salvation. And then Yeshua leads the people over the river into the promised land, which Moses never was able to do, even after 40 years. And um, Joshua succeeds in getting the people to follow the law of God and to conquer their enemies and, and so on. So the book of Joshua is a book of salvation for the people of Israel. But uh, Moses and Joshua are images of the old and the new covenant. So the Mosaic covenant is the old covenant. It won't get you to the promised land. It gets you close, gets you within sight of salvation, but you need a new covenant mediator. You need a Yeshua, a man of salvation, to get you over into the promised land of heaven. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ, the greater successor of Moses. Uh, again, you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. Uh, this calls to mind the promises of greatness given to Abraham. Okay, he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. This recalls 2 Samuel 7, 14. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. That, again, is so central to 2 Samuel 7. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Okay, and of his kingdom, there will be no end. And indeed, there is no end of his kingdom, uh, because we're living in his kingdom now. Uh, we're still in the Holy Kingdom. Catholic Apostolic Church. The Catholic Church is nothing other than the Kingdom of David, ruled over by the Son of David, uh, in the visible hands of the royal steward, who is the successor of Peter, currently a man named Francis, who uh, guides and directs the royal structure of this monarchy in which we live, breathe, pray, and worship on a day-to-day -day basis. This kingdom has lasted for 2,000 years, actually more than that, because David established his kingdom in 1,000 BC. For 3,000 years now, there has been a manifestation of the kingdom of David on earth that is definitely the longest-lived dynasty in the world. So those were the covenants of Moses and David this evening. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this presentation, and we're going to come back next week and fill in those last two boxes. So don't go anywhere. Tune in, same place, same channel. Same time next Thursday uh, for the exciting conclusion when you find out what to draw <laughs> in those last two boxes. So uh, with that, I'll hand it back over to Danny. Thank you very much, Dr. Bergson. That was a great talk. And uh, thanks for stretching us there, taking us to the 700 level. That was a Absolutely. good point with the three seeds. And I had a quick question about um, Abraham sacrificing Isaac. Okay. Yes. Okay, um, I, I usually hear the story that is Abraham's loyalty and fidelity to God and all that, but you seem to bring up a different point of it, that some, something one other person has mentioned to me, that Isaac was probably not a little boy. He was probably maybe a teenager or maybe even a man or something, and that therefore he could have fought Abraham and did not, and therefore essentially he was going along with it. And what you said seemed to suggest that that is the case, that it's not just Abraham, but it really is Isaac Isaac's faithfulness to the Lord and trusting the Lord as well, which is something that's not usually brought out. Am I misinterpreting this? No, you're not. That was my point. Um, indeed. Um, and that's the Jewish tradition in the interpretation of this passage uh, that you can find in the Mishnah and the later uh, Jewish literature. Um, they regard that, uh, that, that act that, um, again, it's called the Akedah in, uh, in uh, the Jewish tradition, which means binding, the binding of Isaac that that was a cooperative act between father and son because uh, Isaac uh, was a young man by that time. You can see that reflected in the biblical text because it's Isaac who carries the heavy load of the wood up the mountaintop, um, whereas the, the aged father, uh, Abraham, who's um, around 100 years old at this time, 
uh, you know, just, just carries the, uh, the coals and the knife. Um, so you've got this, this strapping young, uh, you know, teen or young man. There's different estimates given to his age in the uh, Jewish tradition. Um, but uh, the obvious implication is um, if Isaac is the stronger party, that, that Abraham couldn't have forced this on Isaac. And so in, uh, you know, in Jewish theology, um, Isaac uh, is understood as having merit of his own because he willingly offers himself. It is a death he freely accepts. You know, he goes willingly to his sacrifice like Christ will uh, later. And um, as I mentioned earlier, um, in later Jewish theology, again, the sacrifices in the temple were regarded as representations or reminders of uh, reminders to God of the attempted self-sacrifice of Isaac that took place on the site of the temple way back in uh, the time of the patriarchs. Um, I've never but, heard it referred to that as before as self-sacrifice of Isaac. That's an interesting yeah, term. Yeah, yeah. So that, that casts a whole different light on it. It makes it a much more powerful symbol of, uh, of Calvary. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Great. Um, we have a question from Gabriel who asks, um, in the creed, it says he rose again from the dead. How, why does it say again? <laughs> he only rose once from the dead. Yeah, I think that's just a, a like a grammatic uh, glitch of English. Um, I don't think that has any force. As <laughs> there's some secret resurrection that <laughs> that's in some Gnostic book somewhere, <laughs> and then he rises again in the canonical books. Uh, I think it's it's one of those. Um, you know, one of those funny quirks of, of our language. I don't, I don't think there's any um, doctrinal force to that. Um, the, another thing I would say about that, though, the passage of him rising again, that remember in um, 2 Samuel 7, it, it says to, God says to David, um, after your days are fulfilled, I will raise up your seed after you. And when you look at the apostolic preaching in the book of Acts, the apostles saw the raising up of Jesus as the fulfillment of the promise to David that his seed would be raised up, you know, in this kind of like literal visceral fashion and like out of the grave, like out of the ground. It's like you plant a seed in the ground and then you, rape, you, know, you pull it back up out of the ground. So um, there, there is that, uh, that connection as well. And, and that goes to, uh, there's a question from Tom Parks. In the New Testament, is seed ever used to refer to Jesus? And so that's uh, an example there in Acts with Peter's uh, speech. Yeah, that's true. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, the seed, you know, the seed is an important image in um, the Gospels. Um, remember in uh, the Gospel of um, uh, John, how Jesus says, unless a, uh, a grain of wheat, you know, a seed goes in and dies in the ground, you know, it, it uh, will not bear much fruit. And so he's telling a parable where he's really comparing himself to a seed. And that's picking up on this long tradition of the seed in, um, in the Old Testament. Think also in Matthew 13 of uh, the parable of the mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like this mustard seed that's planted and becomes this great plant. In one sense of that parable, Christ is that seed um, that, um, that goes into the earth, and then he becomes the mystical body, which is the church that fills the whole earth, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's, that's where seed is referring to uh, Jesus. When you were kind of bringing in today's feast day and looking at Luke, when Mary heard all these things, would she have thought, would she have seen it like you do because she knew the scripture so well? Well, we, we tend to assume so because, for example, when the Blessed Mother um, responds um, to uh, Elizabeth's greeting at the visitation uh, with the Magnificat, um, the, the Magnificat is full of scriptural allusions, especially to the prayer of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 2, but also to other key passages of the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. And um, so we tend to assume that the, the Blessed Mother was a pious young woman raised by Joachim and Anne, um, uh, that, uh, that she studied scripture, that she knew scriptures, and um, um, 
and, and so when when Gabriel is communicating to her that she's probably uh, picking up on these uh, these uh, scriptural allusions, the um, Benedictine uh, archaeologist uh, and Bible scholar uh, Bargel Pixner uh, has written a very um, a very interesting, very fascinating book published by Ignatius Press called "In the Footsteps of the Messiah," just kind of um, kind of a a geography of the Holy Land with explanation of different sites in case you go on pilgrimage and walk in the footsteps of the Lord. Anyway, Pixner um, argues that the Holy Family was probably in the um, the group of Jews that were known as the Essenes, which was kind of a, a holiness sect, a very devout sect of Jews that uh, practiced uh, scripture memorization and mm-hmm. uh, cultivated um, a prophetic spirit, uh, kind of like a charismatic community in a way. Uh, and if that was the case, then um, then the Blessed Mother would have, you know, would have learned the scriptures uh, from her childhood. Um, so, yeah, I, I would imagine, imagine so. Uh, Does that answer the question or did I got off track there? <laughs> no, totally. It, it totally just makes me so happy to think how how she knew the scripture and she would have seen all these events unfold, how unbelievable it all is. Yeah, it, it is really remarkable. Thank you know, going back to that, the, to that uh, seed um, question, uh, Danny, just a minute here. Romans 1, 3 refers to Christ as the seed of David. Um, and, uh, and so that's a, that's a very striking passage. A lot of those passages that refer to the seed um, don't show up in English because it comes off as descendants or offspring or something else in English. But I'm just glancing through in the Greek, and there's uh, references to the seed all over. And, um, yeah, I can't even, I can't even. I, I think there's, a, isn't there a reference in uh, Hebrews as well? Yeah, in Hebrews, and Galatians 3.16. Exactly, yeah. And to your seed, which is Christ. It's Galatians 3.16. That's a rather strong one. So, yeah, they're all over. Uh, we have uh, T. Avila asks, my son, who's 12 years old and I are watching, and he wants to know why Moses' brother Aaron made the golden calf. <laughs> yeah, that's a great, oh, that, that's a great story. Uh, a little comical story there. Uh, so uh, Aaron is kind of left in charge at the foot of the mountain and um, kind of doesn't know what to do when the people start getting restless um, and Moses is not coming back. Uh, so he's trying, he tries to placate the people by, um, giving in to, um, their old habits and, uh, see, they had spent 400 years in Egypt and they had basically picked up Egyptian religion in that time. And, uh, the bull God was an important God in Egyptian religion. And so they kind of, they want to go back to that because this whole experiment with this new God of Israel thing and these commandments, this doesn't seem to be working out because Moses hasn't come back. So let's go back to our old ways and then just go back to Egypt. So Aaron placates them and uh, he has them give all their jewelry in. He melts their jewelry down and uh, Aaron actually crafts and fashions this calf out of gold. That's quite a, quite a procedure. Can you imagine doing that, melting down metal and like carving it and forming it and so on? That's going to take you a couple of days to do. And uh, Aaron does this. And, um, and then the people worship it. And it's interesting when you read there in Exodus 32, the people worship the calf and then Aaron identifies the calf as the Lord. Okay. He says, this calf is the Lord. So he's trying to do like a little syncretist thing here. Okay. Like, uh, like meet their paganism halfway and just kind of like make their pagan idol into call it by the name of the Lord. So he does that. Um, of course, that's not a very uh, smart thing to do. Moses comes down the mountain and is uh, very steamed, to say the least. And when he confronts his brother about the calf, it's one of the funniest explanations in Scripture. I was like, yeah, Aaron, what's with this calf? And Aaron's like, well, I took their gold and their ears and stuff. I threw it in the fire and out came this calf. It's like, yeah, right. Oh, yeah, I forgot about those three days I spent carving this thing. Completely escaped my mind. All I remember is that out came this calf. Yeah, that's Aaron in the the golden calf. And you find later in the book of Leviticus, 
the sacrifice that Aaron and his sons have to offer for their sin is a bull calf. And the, the Jewish scholars recognize all, already in antiquity, that's because it, it was with a bull calf that, that Aaron committed his most grievous sin. And so his sacrifice is to be reminded of that and to sacrifice a bull as reparation uh, thereafter. So I don't know if that answered the question, but I had fun talking about that. Good. Uh, Susan asks, reading the Gospel of Mark, Jesus talks about salt, and, and the notes say something about a covenant of salt. How yes. does salt relate to covenants? Is it more human than divine covenant? Um, no, salt, salt was one of the uh, substances that was often incorporated into covenant rituals. Um, salt was a symbol of purity. Um, and uh, it was uh, sprinkled uh, on the sacrifices. Um, salt was also used in meals uh, to season a meal with food. And um, so salt was bound up with this idea of sharing a meal together as family. So as a purity symbol and as a, as a culinary symbol, salt was important. And twice in the books of Chronicles, the um, the covenant of David is referred to as a covenant of salt. Different figures in Chronicles say, do you not know that God gave the covenant of kingship to the sons of David by a covenant of salt? So th th that's true. Um, and and uh, the, a covenant of salt is probably a Hebrew idiom, meaning like a, a pure covenant or a, a covenant of a very sacred nature. Uh, since salt was associated with um, with purity, so um, yeah, definitely the 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 uh, salt image um, that we find in different places uh, in the Gospels um, is also bound up with the idea of being incorporated into the covenant and being covenant bearers. Great, great. Um, it's just reminding me, uh, Dr. Bergsma is the example of the quote I read earlier from St. Augustine, a man who has the scripture memorized and knows the meaning. So, uh, a final question from Gabriel. He says, you mentioned typology. Can someone argue that typology is an imposition of seeing the Bible to fit the Catholic understanding of the gospel? How would someone respond to that? Yeah, um, certainly someone can argue that, and, and in fact they do all the time, and that was argued in the Reformation. Um, the Reformation, the reformers, the, the Protestants, um, made a break with the typological interpretation of Scripture um, and tried to uh, do away with what we call the quadriga, the four senses, and constrain the meaning of Scripture and limit it only to the literal sense. Um, now, what I would uh, what I would do if if someone were to argue that and say that uh, say the New Testament is imposing typology on the old. Well, first of all, I would say it's it's not uh, typology is not limited to a Catholic reading of Scripture. The New Testament itself reads the Old Testament typologically. So the apostles are doing typology. Saint Paul does typology. For example, he says that uh, Sarah and Hagar are types when he argues in um, Galatians uh, about the covenants. So, so if you have an issue with typology, you've got an issue with the apostles because they use it. Um, our Lord uses typology, um, uses images from the Old Testament as images of himself. Um, he takes vineyard images and um, uh, nuptial images and applies them to himself in his parables, and he's drawing those images from the prophets. But what I would, what I would, for somebody who really has a problem with typology, what I would do is take them back into the Old Testament, and what you see is that the prophets of the Old Testament themselves employ typology. So typology is something that is already going on in the Old Testament, and a great example is Isaiah 11, which is a key text in Christmas time. It's the it's the office of readings for Christmas Day. In the Liturgy of the Hours is Isaiah 11. And Isaiah 11 breaks into um, uh, three parts. Um, we just recently had it. Was it this past Sunday or the Sunday before as the first reading? Regardless, Isaiah 11 is very important. But the first five verses of Isaiah 11 talk about a new king coming. 
And that's all Davidic covenant ideas there in the first five verses. Verses 6 through 9 of Isaiah 11 talk about uh, a little child leading the animals and the, the bear lying down with the ox and the ass getting along with other creatures and uh, the lion being peaceful and all. And that imagery in I, Isaiah 6 through 9 is all Edenic imagery. It's all from the Adamic covenant. And then the imagery in Isaiah 11, 10 through 15 is all about raising up a standard and a kind of new Moses who's going to lead a new exodus that's not going to be out of Egypt, but it's going to be from the nations. So when you, when you study that chapter of Isaiah, what Isaiah is doing is he's talking about a future sa savior figure who's going to come, and he's describing the, sa the savior figure in images taken from the Davidic covenant, from the Adamic covenant, and from the Mosaic Covenant. And he's basically saying this new Savior figure is going to be a kind of a new, Mo a new David, a new Adam, and a new Moses. So this prophet is already using images from older parts of the Old Testament, and he's employing them as types for what he's envisioning in the future. And by far, he's not the only one who does this. Jeremiah does it. Ezekiel does it. Um, most of the prophets employ this kind of typology already there. So when we as Catholics continue to employ typology, we're standing in a tradition that begins at least with the prophets of Israel uh, way back, you know, say the, the 8th century BC, and, and we're continuing. We're not doing something new or novel uh, by any means. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.